Great to see you. So this is a three-parter, folks. So, so Luke kicked us off last week, and if you missed it, you missed the treat, particularly the rocket ship. Do you remember the rocket ship that was on PowerPoint? Amazing. He was so pleased with his rocket ship. It was absolutely wonderful. And today, we're thinking at the, ne- the next phase. What does it mean to, to love where we live? And I'm going to do this in three parts, because if we did it in one full, full thing, it'd be about three hours. And that's too much. So we're going to take, I'm going to speak for a little bit. We'll take a break. You can go outside for a fag. You can go to the toilet. And then there will another little bit, bit of a break, connection, and then we'll finish together. That's where we're going. Is that okay? Is that all right in the balcony? Yeah, fantastic. Okay. I can remember 1997. Uh, some of you weren't born in 1997, but that's okay. Some of you were very young. In my A-level politics class with my tutor at the time, Phil Waitman. Phil had been an engineer at Rolls-Royce in Derby. He was a union man through and through. He was as red as red can be. He was a socialist. And he bought this little transistor radio. And I explained to Luke earlier, no, I don't mean an app. I don't mean the internet. I mean a proper tiny little radio with those really long aerials. Do you remember those? And we gathered around... And we were listening to Tony Blair, who just won the general election. And, we're, and, and, and the, the two memories that I have is, one, listening to those words, a new day has dawned, has it not? And it was like this spine-tingling moment. And it was mirrored by the fact that there was a, a guy who had taught us, who was teaching us politics, who was deeply passionate about it. And for him, it was like this, it was like this amazing moment where the thing that he dreamt of for so long was actually happening. It was incredible. Can, got such, such very clear memories. It was a time of optimism. And the reason that I say that is, is I've been in this job for about two years, I think, now. And if I'm honest, there are moments where I think, I wish I could have been a vicar in a different time. Like the 90s would have been awesome. Like I think the music was better in the 90s. That's my humble opinion. Uh, Britpop, Oasis, remember those? You know, Blur, Song 2, absolutely incredible. It was a time, I think, of optimism. It was a time of somewhat more political stability. That's my own opinion. Don't want to get controversial on that, you know. Um, there was a, a time, it was kind of pre-9-11 uh, in fact, interestingly, people tell us now that the younger generation are mirroring the 90s in their dress, and their dress start with a shame. I wish I kept my clothes because I'd have been cool. Well, actually, I wasn't then, so maybe I wouldn't be now. But it was a time of optimism. And there's been moments, and I think it was an optimism, pol- optimistic politically, I think culturally. And I think it was optimistic in the life of the church. I think, it, I think to the songs that were written in that season particularly if you're for the tradition that we're in, which will be the charismatic evangelical. It was a time of a great move of the Holy Spirit. It was a time of confidence, a time of sal- real significant salvations, of an outpouring of the Spirit, of God moving in the most amazing ways. And so there are moments where I think, Lord, you know, there's been multiple prime ministers in the time that I've been in this job. There's been crazy stuff happening around the world. There's political instability. There is a war on European soil. There's tens- massive tensions in the Middle East. We- there are things happening in America. There's this, there's this mm, in- kind of crisis in the uh, environmental crisis, climate change. There's been issues around race and lots of conversations. But it's this season of political turmoil when it's about gender, loads of stuff. And it feels the time is a lot less confident. Am I depressing you or why? This, this, is, this, is, this is part of the, this is the jeering us up. And there's moments when I thought, oh, Lord, if only I could, if only I could have been born earlier. And it would have been so much better, Lord. It would have been so much fun to minister in the power of the Spirit. It would have been so much fun, Lord. Why did you make me born in 1979? And why have you done this now? Oh, Lord, Why? Why could it not be a different time? And there is something beautiful about the heart cry of Mordecai to Esther, which we're going to think about, which Luke kicked off last week. And he said, for such a time as this. For such a time as this. 
And that heart cry, that wisdom to Esther, I found really challenging, both, both in terms of the season of life I think we're in as a nation, but the season of life I find myself in personally. Lord, really? But for such a time as this. We've tracked on and off the last couple of years, we've jumped into particularly some stories from the Old Testament, and we've, we've tracked something called the exile, where the people of God have been taken from their home and taken to a place that they don't want to be in and a time that doesn't work for them. And the heart cry has always been for such time as this, for God to use us in the places that he has placed us. Often when things are very much stacked against individuals or God's people, God has called them into that moment. The book of, um, the book of Esther is amazing because it rarely mentions prayer and it rarely mentions God. Isn't that weird? So why look at it? Because what it tells us, the book of Esther, is that in a season of turmoil, in a season where nothing makes sense, when it seems like the miraculous days of old have gone, it tells us that God is still working. That God is still on the throne. That he's not, he may be silent, but he is not absent. And what Esther reveals to us is that God has a plan, that God is using his people in a variety of different ways to draw his purposes together for such a time as this. So here we are, folks, 2023. It's in, we're in Sheffield, the beautiful city of Sheffield. And the vision, uh, a sense of our church is for, to be a church that is for the city. That, for me, is rooted in Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, I'm just putting my watch there because this clock here says half past 12. So who knows what time we're going to finish without some kind of, you know, it could be, it could be a, a wild ride, folks, couldn't it? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, the people of God, God are taken from Jerusalem. They're taken to Babylon, they're made to live in exile, and they are given, there's three choices facing them. And those three choices that um, um, an amazing man called Timothy Keller, who has written extensively about what it is to, to function in cities, says there are three choices that face the people of God then, and there are three choices that face us now. The first choice facing the people of God in exile situations is when you are in a culture which is alien to your own value system and beliefs, we have one of three things that we can do. One is we acquiesce to the culture. It means that we lose our distinctiveness. It means that we lose what it is we believe. It means we lose our heart and passion for God because we begin to chase after things that surround us. That we can acquiesce. We become no different from the people around us. We lose our kind of saltiness. We lose our grit. The second thing is, he says, that faces the, the people of God is that we, we, we set up camp, we set up life on the margins and we become a clique. So like we never venture out, the church becomes these kind of big castles and, and, we, and we leave occasionally and then we come back in and we huddle together for safety because it's a big bad world. I don't know why I did the voice, I just felt I should to make the drama. But because it's a scary place, it's, a, it's an anxious place, it's a place that is offensive and, and, and so it would make sense to retreat from it because it might pollute us and so we, we, stay, we, become, we become removed from it. That's the second thing that can happen. That's a very, very common thing for us to fall into. And it means as a church, we can become about maintaining what we have we can become about maintaining the church. We can become about keeping the status quo because outside is so scary. It can become about being driven by a sense of nostalgia. I've just done it, the 90s. All the stuff that, all the great stuff that happened in times gone by and the present seems so scary 
and the future uncertain. So we stay rooted in what was, sticking together in a kind of Christian world. Or there's a third way. And we see that in Jeremiah 29. And that is the way of mission. The way of people who are sent to a place, knowing that they belong to a different place manifesting and living out the values of that other place in the presence of the place God has them. They did not choose to go. They did not choose the time. But God says, for such a time as this. And what I want to say to us today, in September 2023, in the craziness that is happening in the world, it is our time to step up to step out, to become the church of Jesus Christ, to play our part in the city of Sheffield, to work for the renewing of all things. A couple of things. Let's um, have, uh, I think there's a PowerPoint on here somewhere. There you go, for the city. I didn't do this, just you probably can tell that already, can't you? There's no way I did this. Uh, uh, There's the city of Sheffield and all its finery. Let's have the the next uh, slide, please, if we can. A family of hope. Okay. So I saw some statistics came out on Friday about decline in the Church of England. Very jolly, folks. It really is. Not going to talk about it because it's going to make us all a bit depressed. I think it's like the average church is about four people and a dog or something like that. It's, It's terribly discouraging. Um, and uh, yes, I just thought, well, I, I, as I saw it, I just felt the, the faith levels just, <laughs> just dripping away. So we're not going to speak about it because we're part of a different story. We belong to a God who always makes things new. That doesn't mean we're ignoring it, but we're not going to dwell on it. Why a family of hope? Here's the thing. We know that in the current, the, there is a mental health crisis, and we see that most acutely with the generation that are, that are emerging. And if you spend any time with somebody, who a young person, you'll know that there is a, human, a, a real literacy in the language of mental health. There's a real literacy and understanding around these anxious times in which we live. And the challenge for my generation... And the older generation is we roll our eyes at the generation coming through. We'll never reach them if we roll our eyes at them. We won't, never. So what do we do as a church? Here's the thing. I believe that God has placed in our church over many years, he's deposited a hunger and a call for mission, a hunger and a call for the city. This was confirmed to me when James Royal, who was uh, doing stuff up, in the computers, I don't know what he was doing, but he was taking something apart and he found a tiny little vision card, I think it was from the late 80s. And it talked about St. Thomas Crooks having a heart for the city. It feels to me that God has not taken that calling off our church. A church that is hungry for mission and evangelism in our city, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Jesus. And secondly, a church that knows we need the presence of the Holy Spirit every time we gather, both in church and in every household where we meet. We need his presence. We need to rely on his presence. And it seems to me that God hasn't taken that off. And as missional communities and clusters were formed in the 90s, and praise God for the pining work that people like Mike Breen did. Super smart people, way smarter than me. I'm just taking that stuff and rebadging it. There isn't, as I said to the 9 a.m. this morning, there is nothing new here, folks. Because Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. We're just taking what was and saying, what does it look like to proclaim, as the Book of Common Prayer says, to proclaim afresh in this generation? And one of the things we're going to have to capture is in the 90s, we sent people out into, in a season that was far more secure than it is now. Now we need to go as a family of believers together. Because we need to be able to, the different generations need to be able to serve the younger generations. And the younger generations need to glean the wisdom and the stability and the security of the older generations. One of the great joys to me and our team is working with Heather Andrews. Now, Heather's, there's a little bit of an age gap between us. Only a few years, not really. But, you know, she brings so much to the party because she has lived longer than I have and gone through crazy experiences. 
But right now in this current season, I can, I can glean from her wisdom. I, I need her wisdom in my life. In fact, everybody needs Heather Andrews in their life. Amen. But we need other people in our lives. We need to come against the, sea, the, the, the kind of stronghold in our culture which idolizes autonomy and individualism. And say so we stand as a family where we prefer the other, not just pursue our own way. It is the way of Jesus. It is the way of the early church. And so we begin to understand that we're a church family, which means we begin to celebrate each other, we begin to celebrate what God is doing. But we celebrate the fact that we are a church family. We are not just lone people sent out, but we go as a community, a family. He creates and sets us in the context of a family. It's the thing that he has always done. He takes the lonely and he sets them in a family. He takes the ones whose, whose actual real families have perhaps been complicated and we're adopted into something new and it's profoundly beautiful. And that is, folks, why as you walk in, you'll see pictures are taken on a Polaroid camera. Polaroids, isn't that great? It's what they used to use in the 80s because we're a family. All shapes and sizes. Some of us with funny accents. Some of us with proper posh voices from different places in the world. But we're a family. And as a family, we are going to set ourselves in the context of tables. And I want to talk about what it is to mean to love where we live. God has placed us in the city for a season, for, for a time. Maybe you're here forever. Maybe you're here for a season, for a job or whatever. God has placed us in this little patch of the city. And while we're here, we're called to cultivate it and to love it. And we are stepping into this season of, of, out of Church of Churches, which is a way that we organised a lot of our communities. And I'm going to put my hands up now. So we, we know that the journey into tables has been organic. <laughs> we know it's been clunky. And we know that's been hard for people, not knowing what the heck you're doing. <laughs> We know that's been really tough. And, and, you know, I have to, a lot of that is down to me and my superb admin skills. It really is. There are other factors, but we have to own that and just say, look, I'm sorry that we've got that wrong and I'm sorry that has caused stress for people. It's never our intention. But let me just take a moment now to explain something of the heart behind what it is we're wanting to do. We want to take meeting in small groups. We've changed them, rebranded. If you've been around in church a long time, you just think, it's just a cell group. Yeah, okay. You've got us, all right? You've got us. We've called them tables. Um, it's actually Sam Watson who came up with the, the name table. Uh, so credit, credit to Sam. If it went really badly, um, if, it went, if, it, if it had gone uber well, there was you know, no complaints about the organisation, I'd have taken full credit for it. But um, it was actually all, all his idea. Um, and a couple of things we're doing. So we're emphasizing eating together. We wanted to create community. We know that when we eat together, there's, there's a sense of inclusion and welcome. And we know that happens very naturally, happens in lots and lots of different cultures around the world. We know that hospitality and food is really important. So we want to be able to do that. The second thing we want to do is we want to so we value hospitality, hospitality. Hospitality. The second thing is we want to keep them open. Here's the temptation, folks. It's so tempting to say that my group is now full. We have a level of intimacy and deep spiritual connection with one another that if a newcomer comes, it will be destroyed forever. I cannot share my life in front of a stranger. So we just metaphorically, because we'd never admit that, unless you're really honest, we close the door. And we say, we don't want anyone else. We're fine, thank you very much. And yet, for somehow, that doesn't seem to capture the generosity of God or the heart of hospitality we see in the scriptures. It means that we share our vulnerabilities. We take a risk 
that we invite in people who we don't know so that we can continue to grow. The other thing that we want to do is to step into places of prayer and that we begin to move in the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit every time we gather. Not just to the few six or seven people who respond on a Sunday, the brave souls who come to the front and they're pounced on by the prayer team. Oh, shit, get up, up, up. No, no, all of us together in a really natural way, when we meet in communities, we are pressing into the presence of God asking him to move supernaturally to bring healing and breakthrough and deliverance as we meet in homes as normal, everyday believers in Jesus. That that's the heart of it. That we so know that we need him, that we're so reliant on him that he moves. Because we know that when we gather in the name of Jesus, he promises his presence. And if his presence is there, we know that he's a foretaste, an embassy, a place where he rules and he reigns. It's a place of hope because it's where he dwells amongst us. And if we say that we are made in the image of God... That is partly worked out in the context of community. That's why family is so important to us. It means that we begin to get the identity that God has for us through other people as they speak into our lives, as they love us into being, as, and as they love us and as they speak wisdom, that we begin to grow to become like him. The complexity has been we have, made commu- we have made missional communities or clusters about people and community. They haven't always been about the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been about making friends. And that's great and that's wonderful. But the purpose in the scriptures is when we meet, is we meet for one reason. And that is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Friendship is a fruit. Family is a fruit. But we pursue Jesus Christ. And the final thing as we love where God, where we live, is that we recognize, and I think this is something beautiful that the Holy Spirit has done in our church for generations, is that we recognize that, that each one of us, as soon as we encounter the Lord Jesus Christ, as soon as he takes our sin and our shame and puts a new identity, and that takes years, I know, to work through, he gives us a mission The God of mission who reaches us, draws us into his mission. And that mission is always to represent him in various contexts. All of us folks get to play. My heart would be that for every table that meets as part of our church, that it grows. And as it grows, it develops into a house church. Now, when we talk about house churches, people always say, well, I went to a house church back in 1972 and it met in a school hall. House churches meet right now all around the world, often in places where you cannot meet publicly the Spirit of God. For He's done this since the church was birthed. Actually, he started in the synagogue movement, but I won't talk about the synagogue movement in the second century because it's very boring, although I find it very interesting. But essentially, they were houses of prayer a house is a house dedicated to the presence of God. What would it be like if we had tens or even hundreds of houses that were set apart for the glorification of Jesus Christ? That when we met, meet together, we meet in his name. That's why we break bread in tables. We don't do communion. Don't tell the bishop. We're doing breaking bread together because in a time of anxiety, there's something about celebrating the sacraments. But as they grow, they become places we can invite people in. And you say, well, that sounds like a cluster. Yes, it does. Because it's, it's from the book. It wasn't invented by a man. It was from the book that Jesus Christ gathers people in together to connect with communities as missional people, drawing in the people who are far from him into our orbit and into our world. And by his grace, the Spirit of God reveals Jesus Christ to them.
So our hope is, folks, that, that over this season, the tables will grow and they'll multiply and some will come together and we'll start to say, well, God has placed us in this part of the city of Sheffield. I live near Broom Hill. Hey. Okay, I know some of you in the table I go to, you're just leaving me hanging here right now. That's okay. <laughs> So what does it look like for us to intentionally come together and say, let's pray for every one of our neighbours and in faith believe that Jesus will open a door for them to walk from darkness into light? What does it mean? Do we believe that? Does that sound too much like what we've done before? And yet the, the power of God, the presence of God I believe, has drawn us back to his heart with stuff like make room, break out the unplowed ground. And now he's saying, lift, Psalm 120, lift your eyes to the hills. Lift your eyes. See, because I am sending you, releasing you into the city of Sheffield to bring and minister the kingdom of God in the places we find ourselves. Okay, let's pause there, folks. Turn to the person next to you, say, are you alive? This is a part two. Um, you're going to wish you'd have gone home at that point because we're going to talk about money. Hey, that's it. Okay, let's, let's have the uh, next slide, please, if we can. Oh, look at them. Okay, so um, at this time of year, people like me will, roll, will, get, will come out and say, um, giving is all about discipleship. Except the problem is we always do it this time of year <laughs> when we're looking to raise money. So I want to be as honest as we can and say, yes, giving is about discipleship. As Martin Luther said, there are three conversions. The third one is the wallet. We absolutely know that. So I just leave that with you. Uh, I'm not saying it today because it is a discipleship issue, although it is a discipleship issue. I'm saying it today because the uh, finances are somewhat tight. As ever, we do not have a reserves policy here, folks. We don't, we don't have a pot of money for a rainy day. Uh, we don't. We, we, um, we rely on the generosity of the church family. We have done for a lot, for many, 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 many years. Um, that is in line with a lot of churches in, in different places, uh, but we don't. And so as we step into, as Luke spoke about last week, we want to be a church that is planting and grafting, partnering with the diocese and the Yorkshire Baptists. That means that we have committed money to plant churches in other places around the city. So for Vale, uh, Stannington, which is uh, over, over the other side of the hill, to, uh, team was grafted there in March. Uh, Gareth Ingle went in September. Um, he's been back, we'll get Nick back and these guys are doing great things. But, but as a church, we have changed in the last couple of years the way that we, that we allocate our resources because we've committed to partnering with the diocese and we've committed partner, partnering with the Yorkshire Baptists to, to plant churches. And Luke will go next year. And... <laughs> who was that? Unbelievable. Is that, is that you, Heather? Unbelievable. Sorry about that, Luke. Um, tell your mother to be quiet. Um, and uh, the, the diocese are going to give us some money too. So a guy, John Marsh, who's, who's at the back now, he's in charge of the money. So if you're near him, please pin him down. And whatever he's going to give us, double it or he can't leave the building. Is that all right? Yeah, so I'm balcony, guys. I'm relying on you, all right? Um, so Luke will go and we'll commit to, to, um, to, to helping Luke buy a Tesla because it's important for his ministry, so he tells us. Uh, that is a joke, folks. It is a joke. But we want to commit St. John's because it, it, both at uh, um, Fervale and uh, St. John's Park are in areas of, of, of deprivation, and we give away what God has given us. And so as a church, we've oriented our finances so that we can do that, and more and more plants and grafts as they come. And so that means, folks, we are reliant on the generosity of the church, but on the Lord Jesus, who is sovereign, to cover all of our needs. And church planting ain't cheap, but it's something I believe that the Lord is calling us to do. Now, a bit of feedback, uh, I've just been honest. When I did this earlier at the nine o'clock, I got a few details wrong. 
Like, who's part-time, who's full-time? Just minor things like that, folks. So my man Joe Overton at the back has given me some feedback, so I need to keep it big picture because I don't want to perjure myself too much. So let's have the next slide before I say something wrong. So, okay, so we have um, committed to investing in young people. Lydia, you have been placed under the young people. I hope that has encouraged you. No end. There you go. Young at heart. Let's give a round of applause. Wonderful. Okay. So... Lydia, why, why, don't, why don't you stand up? Um, this is Lydia. If, if you don't know Lydia, she's a legend. There you go. If you're, you're watching at home, you can't see Lydia, but she's, she's, well, she's there, actually, um, um, with the young people. Um, Lydia has stepped into leading Tots and Toddlers for us, and she's doing that in a voluntary capacity, and we're just absolutely delighted because as we step in to become a church that is uh, planting churches, we cannot have as big a staff team that we've had in the past because we are marshalling those resources to other places, to other parts of the city to give that stuff away. So we are so grateful to Lydia. We've Ben, Harley, Mason, you know, Bethan, who's leading today, fantastic, and Joel, they, those guys are working part-time. But we wanted to be able to invest in young people. The statistics for uh, 18s to 30s in the church in our nation is pretty depressing, folks. And, and so we, there is a, with a university down the road, two universities, one in the city and one down the road, it, it is absolute clear as eggs is eggs, that we have to, we have this mission field on our doorstep, folks, that will go on to be the culture shapers of the future. The teachers, the doctors, whatever it is they're going to do, work in shops, right now they don't know Jesus. And we have an opportunity in our city because they're our neighbours to reach them. We are crazy if we don't put some resource into that. Ben Harley Mason, the kids did an amazing job there. We got to pray because there's such a battle on over our young people and our children. We got to pray like stink for that. That's a great word. Let's have the next slide, please. Okay, we've got a creative team. Uh, why we got a creative team? Because if we want to stay connected with the next generation, people use the internet and that first tube and all that kind of stuff and tick, tick, tick or tick tock, whatever you want to. And, and you might think you hate it. And it's a waste of time, and it's of the devil himself, but, but that's where people are. And that's, if that's where people are, it's where we should be. And so we've made some changes to be able to do it. And these guys do an amazing job. Let's have the next slide, please. And we've got the wonderful Heather and Alana Barr, who's over there. You might see well-being and pastoral. What on earth does that mean? We recognize in the current season of life that with the mental health crisis that we're in, the church needs to get better at serving and equipping people. And so Alana is going to gather people together so as a church we can help disciple, work through, and what does it look like to flourish and step into wholeness and freedom, which releases Heather to step into prayer and building a prayer community because this whole thing rests on the presence of God, so we need to pray. And that's her heart, and that's what we're looking to step her into. Let's have the next slide, please. We uh, Wonderful Kevin Quinton, who heads up Social Transformation. Kevin here? That's awkward, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's Kevin. Uh, he's, he's, do you know why he's not here? Because he wasn't with the young people, and he got offended. <laughs> That's why he's not here. No, he's not here. So Kevin oversees that in a voluntary capacity. Uh, we're very grateful to Mike and Wendy and the guys there. Uh, as a church, we fund Claire, a lady called Claire, who works for Christians Against Poverty with our friends at Networks Church Sheffield. That's the giving from our church, helping some of the poorest people in our city. STC Nursery, we're advertising to somebody come and lead that strategic way into the community. Um, our, we are looking for a new Baptist minister, and a key role for that person will be to, to grow our ministry and connections amongst the poor. God's bias is towards the poor. And we can't outsource it anymore to our friends at Philadelphia. I, don't mean, I, didn't, I didn't expect the laugh from that, but it's true <laughs> that we want to be able to move in a position where as a church family, we can play our part in serving the least, the last, and the lost. And the mate, guys are doing amazing work here. And we're so grateful. A lot of these guys are volunteers but there is more for us to do, and that is what we're wanting to do. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay, so 2024, the purpose of today is saying, okay, 2024 is coming. What do, we, what do we want to do? Let's go for it. Interns. We want us to work with New Wine to start a new intern program here, working with people around the country. That would be awesome. Uh, more of that coming. Uh, I've done that. <laughs> Let's keep going. Yes, done tables in house churches, food about That is growing, folks, which is sad because of the need, but it is an amazing opportunity for us as a church to work with people in our community. Let's keep going. Evangelism. Now, uh, Joel Pollard, I don't know if he's here. Raise a stand up, Joel. Give him a round of applause if you know him. Okay. Okay. You can take it too far, Joel. Um, <laughs> if we're going to be a church for the city, we need a local story. And we don't really have one as yet. So part of Joel's, Joel is, is, is gathering people who will love our community and our locality. The flats next to us are people, it will be in there who hardly ever see a soul. And so we have, uh, our, they are our neighbors. We have an opportunity to reach them. We're praying for God to open doors. We want to be present at Christmas, but we want to love our locality. We haven't got an, an integrity for a city if we don't have a story locally. And we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. So that's what we want to do more of. Excuse me. Next slide, please. <laughs> Eco. Folks, we need some solar panels. Amen. So uh, gift day, next couple of weeks, is all going towards getting, uh, so for my Tesla folks, that's what it is really, it really is. But we want to become, step into that, and in order to do that, we're going to have to make some very significant changes in our church bu building. These lights here are incredibly hot, they use a lot of electricity, uh, and we have a lot of roof space. Great opportunity. So, uh, but that costs money, so we want to invest in that. Let's have a next slide, please. Diversity. As you notice, it's not particularly diverse on the platform, you may have noticed. That is something that we want to reflect the heart of our city. We've been doing some work on that. It's stored recently. We want to get that going because we want to be able to reflect the character of the city as best we can. Let's keep going. Okay, there you go. Let's, um, okay. Now, I was thinking, uh, we've been thinking around what does it look like to, to um, oh man, I've messed up, to belong, to serve, to give, which means. Um, I believe that there are visions and stuff that the Holy Spirit wants to release in our church through people who are here, who are watching online. And let me tell you how God is going to do it through you. He's going to do it through the thing that really frustrates you about our church. Not that anybody would ever feel frustrated about anything. Or the thing that make you angry. Or the things that, that I've missed off here. I didn't make the PowerPoint, just out of being a little defensive right now, but there'll be something that I haven't said or something I haven't emphasized, and right now it's making you angry, it's frustrating you. That could be the very thing that the God, God is saying is the thing that he's laid on your heart and he's wanting to raise you up to do something about it. I think that's how visions sometimes work. The thing that annoys you is often the thing, the thing that you don't see is the thing that God is speaking to you about. These are the things that I would love to see us. This is why I'm going off script. People on the team, I, I did say I might go off script. This is it. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, I think we need to get clear about fostering folks. Our city is reaching out to the church to come and take on the children of our city, and we're not stepping up to the plates. I think as a church, we need to do that. I think as a church, there's an opportunity for to go to prisons and work with ex-offenders. There is an opportunity to become more diverse. There is an opportunity for us, people who are creative, artistic. It's a white box, and it's been like this for ages, and it's really bland, and I don't know what to do about it. And everybody says it's so corporate. Well, give us a hand. If you're creative, come and help us. For those of you who are gardeners, now, I get feedback saying there's a lot of weeds outside. There is, folks. Would you like to come and pick them out? That would be wonderful. Um, because um, I keep getting Luke, trying to get Luke to do it, but he doesn't know what a difference between a weed and a plant. So, he's, so, so if you see it, will you come and help us? I do appreciate your feedback. I really do. But if um, do come and help us if you've got a spare moment. Um, that would be one. Or, or send your gardener to come and do it for us. Um, Seniors, um, 
There's loads of people living in our community who, who are widowed or widowers by themselves, and um, we have an incredible opportunity to reach out. And I think as a church, we should, in the same way we, we have people who work with young people, uh, we need people who are going to work with the, the generation that have poured so much, for in many cases, into our lives, and we need to honour them better, is my view. Uh, I think we need um, intercessors, people who will commit to walking the streets and praying for God's kingdom to come. We need people who are going to commit to doing evangelism, the SAS style, out on the streets, because that's where people are. I can't even read this one. Uh, And I've got no idea. I didn't know I could write Arabic. It's a real gift. It really is. Um, uh, One is about prayer community. Want to get get behind Heather. And um, if if you think, well, I don't know what to bring. uh, All of us us called to pray. And um, we're going to need to commit to pray because this whole thing rests on him. And he loves it when we talk to him. Uh, And that's what we should do. Next week, we're going to be thinking about what it looks like for people to recognize their place of influence, uh, the workspaces and workplaces. We, if, you're in a, if you're in work, we want to champion you. Uh, we don't want everybody to become vicars. Please don't. God has put you in places of influence, and we want to honor and celebrate. We want to celebrate those who are starting business, uh, creating wealth. I realize in Sheffield, the People's Republic of South Yorkshire, that can be a little tricky, but we should celebrate and people who are wanting to work for justice and wanting to create wealth in the city and employ people. We, as a church, we want to champion you. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's jump into the scripture let's, um, uh, and tie this together. What does, it, uh, what does it mean to be a church that's for the city? We're all going to need to play our part, folks. And that's a lot more just than the money that we bring. It's about giving our lives, to the, to the, giving our lives over to the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes, he calls us to, to give everything, to surrender and follow him. And this is, um, this is what we're looking at here in the book of Esther. And I've got the book of Ezra, which is not what we're doing. So that's going to, I did think that's not what I read earlier, but there you go. Okay. <laughs> so there, okay. Verse 14, chapter 4, verse 14. This is Mordecai. It's really calling on Esther to, to do something. This is what he says. If you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent a reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat and drink for three days, three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king. Even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. It's hard to fully appreciate, I think, the predicaments that that Esther is in here. She's been picked out from a crowd of uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the most beautiful women, and she has got a place in the palace by virtue of the way that she looks. And we know, as Luke explained beautifully last week, that she, even though she is married to the king, she's unable to go up to him and talk to him. If she does, if she, if she doesn't follow palace protocol, she'll be killed. And I think that there are a couple of things, I think, that, that we say we, we've got a vision for the city. And there are three things that we can see in the scriptures that say something to us. Firstly, the, the, the book of Ezra, which I opened by mistake earlier, is about the prophetic cry. What does it look like? A priestly cry out for God to come back to him. There's a, a calling for repentance. There is a calling to, to make Jesus Christ the front and center of our lives, to, to inhabit every space within us because he longs to bring freedom to us. And that is the, the heart cry of Ezra is to bring the people back to a love and knowledge of God. 
So all of us who are in the city of Sheffield are called to make Jesus Christ, to, to give everything that we have over to him. And that is always in the pathway of surrender, seeking to give God everything that is ours. And the second thing is Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a planner. Now, I've got nothing in common with Nehemiah. But he, some say he was like an urban planner. Some say he was an engineer. These three books of the Bible together tell us that if we're going to have a hunger for the city, firstly, we need a heart for God. And secondly, we need engineers. We need builders. We need people who are planned. We need people who are going to be strategic in the city, who are going to, through their, through their actual physical work, and, if, and if, if our work is worship to him, then as God calls us to stack shelves in Aldi, or whether he's calling you to the corner office with the plush carpet, he is, he's placing us in a place where we can use our skills and giftings for his glory. And as we use those skills and giftings, we, de- we reflect, Reflects the fact that we are made in his image. Hallelujah. Thank you. So if you're creative, if you're a problem solver, if you're good with numbers, if you're a builder, you can make things out of your hands. My, my dad died a couple of, about two weeks ago, and he was amazing at making things. He was an engineer. And as we started to think about what we do with his stuff, I'm amazed how many tools he's got and think about the stuff that he could make. All of the way that he was wired reflected the one who created him. You see, to reach a city isn't just a Shabbat session with Heather in the shed on a Friday, although that's awesome. It is recognizing that your workplace that God has placed you is the place that he's got you for such a time as this. Not just so you can evangelize at the water cooler, but that you can work diligently and with integrity and do your job for him. Be the best teacher you can be. Be the best shop worker, whatever it is God's got you to do. To plan. If you're an urban planner in the city of Sheffield, you're following Nehemiah. Praise God. Let's pray for the people who are looking after the city center. Come on. Hallelujah. I pray for it. God, this is a dump. Jesus, let's see the breakthrough. Because that's what Nehemiah does. He redesigns a city. It's like we're called to garden, to create things, to make things. That is our calling, to create things of beauty. And then finally in the book of Esther, Esther is in the palace, the place of influence. And the thing is that Esther is taken as a young orphan Jewish girl, so she must have had an imposter syndrome. Can you imagine you're plucked from obscurity? The only thing you've got going for you is beauty. And so it must have been that as she, by the, by the, but since she's picked by the king and by the time we get to Mordecai, it's about five or six years, it must have been a terribly insecure place for her to be in. Absolutely riddled with anxiety. Not only was the system she was in was totally controlling, totally fear-based, but her rise to it was based on insecurity. She had to hide her Jewish identity. And she overhears that there is a plan to annihilate the Jewish people. An act of deep racism to destroy a people group. And as she hears it, she knows that she will be killed. And yet if she speaks out because she has been placed there because of her looks, and if her looks fades, then she's gone. It is a, a, she's in a context that is insecure. Maybe that's what it feels like for your workplace. You feel like an imposter. You got the job, you're not sure how. And you worry if they recheck your CV, you might, be, you might lose your job. Or you think, well, I've got this job. Or uh, I remember there's somebody very kindly wrote on YouTube on one of my talks that I only got the job because I knew Mick Woodhead, which is very encouraging. I was very, I was, it's lovely. And they're always anonymous, these people. They never reveal their true identity. God bless them. And there's a sense when you hear that, you think, well, maybe I did. And that can build insecurity if you can feed an imposter syndrome. Maybe you're in a place in your job and you feel, I don't really think I should be here. I haven't got the qualifications to be here. And and so you can feel like an imposter. So if you feel like an imposter, when somebody asks you to step out, your initial reaction is no, because I'll be found out. 
Or, or maybe it's a different context where you've clawed your way into the workplace. You've grafted hard. You've worked those extra miles. I mean, extra miles, extra hours. And you've, you know, you've sp- spoken well to the right people. Um, I remember a friend of mine who's, a, who's um, a doctor said to me, man, he said, oh, these people just, I'm surrounded by people who just kiss ass. Don't get promoted. And he said, it can't be like that in the church, can it? And I said, well, funny you should say that, mate. <laughs> it can, actually. You know, the people that they just ambitious. And if, you'd, if, if, if you climb over people to get to top jobs, you can carry a sense of entitlement. And then when somebody asks you to do something, like Mordecai says, Desi, you'll never want to do it. Because if you do it, you'll give up the very thing that feeds your identity. And you know, and then Mordecai says something which Luke talked about last week, and he said, You never know, maybe you were called for such a time as this. What does those, what's that little phrase say? It says to Esther, You are there in a place that you did not choose, in a time that you cannot control by the grace of God. God placed you there. And if God placed you there, God will go with you as you step out into the things he's asking you to do. And the scriptures don't tell us. So when people talk about this, they speculate. But there must have been, oh no, I nearly fell over then. There must have been something that happened in Esther's life where she realized that God's grace was on her that it was him. And so her response is one of grace, which is call every Jew to fast. Does that mean it's like we've got to fast because if we don't fast, God won't do it? No, it's like if God asks us to do something, we want him to be be central, to be front and centre in everything that we do. So they pray. And the most remarkable thing happens. The the thing that, that the enemy intends to wipe out God's people is averted through the bravery of this remarkable woman who realizes it is God's grace. And you know, we should just finish the sermon there and say we should all be like Esther. But you know what? If we do that, Esther may inspire us But the problem of inspiration, and I want to go out on a limb and say this, inspiration is great, but it generally draws off guilt. I should be like them. I should be like Esther. But you know, here's the thing. Esther points to one who was came, who left the palace of glory and stepped into the earth, who made it possible for you and I to stand in grace and say we have a perfect Father in heaven who loves us. Jesus Christ takes our sin and our shame. He removes the idols in our life. Where we build a life on something that is not of him, we'll never want to give it up. But he calls us to trust him and step out. Friends, if our tables and our communities are built on relationships that feed us, and make us secure and safe. We'll never step out of the comfort of our communities to reach the people that are around the corner. We'll never do it. That's why Esther points us to the grace of God, that he's the grace of God who's given us all of this. That's why we're called to give it away. That's why it's going to be heartbreaking to send off Luke and Hannah and Isaac, but it's the will of God, because God calls us to give away everything that he has given us us. And when we give it away, he gives us more and he gives us double. That's why when we step out in tables, we're going to invite more people, even if you don't like them, because do you know what? The Bible tells us, bear with one another. And God's grace to you may be that really irritating person you hope doesn't turn up on Tuesday. He's God's way of dealing with something in your life for such a time as this. 
And as they grow to become house churches, it might be said, well, God has placed us in a part of the city and we're going to pray like stink for the Spirit of God to break into people's lives that people can walk heading for hell into life, from darkness into light, into transformation and healing. And it may be as a church we begin to invite people into our communities who have come out of a life of prison, who've come out of lives that are totally different from ours as we leave the, leave the palace of S10. And all the privilege that God has given us, we share it with the city of Sheffield and we share it with people of God has given us. And we won't do that if we hold on to the things that identify us that are not of him. We step into the grace of Jesus. I read something this week and it's totally profound. It, actually, it probably wasn't profound. It was for me. For you, be like, yeah, it's obvious. It was... You know when, when, when the devil comes and says, your prayer life isn't good enough? And you go, yeah. You get down and down and down. In the spiritual battle, actually, it's not always the devil. It's just our own flesh often. And you think, not doing this, not doing this, not doing this. What the grace of God comes and says, he says, I know, but I'm forgiven. And I'm loved. And I'm free. Shame has no hold over us. Shame does not define us. And the enemy of God is terrified of Christians who walk in humility, who say, we don't have the answers. Got no idea what we're doing. Uh, and we don't have any money, Lord. Would you give us some? And Lord, we're terrified because we're going to send out Luke. Uh, and maybe all the cool people will follow him because he's a cool guy. And do you know what? That's okay. Because the Lord is on the throne. And it's all his anyway. So folks, as we move forward to love our city, not really sure how it's all going to work. But I do know if we commit to belonging, serving one another, giving what we have, the Lord will see us right. And the Lord will do what only he can do. Let's stand together, shall we?